We are starting a new series today that I'm very excited about. We're calling it Citizens, and it's based on the very first part of Jesus' most famous sermon that is known as the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, The verses that we're going to be looking at for the next few months will be Matthew chapter 5, 1 through 12. Yes, for two months, we're going to be in 12 verses. Uh, One beatitude at a time. We're going to enjoy it. Uh, This opening section here of the Sermon on the Mount has become known as the Beatitudes. How many of you have heard that word before? The Beatitudes, a lot of you have heard that. Uh, It comes from the Latin word that means blessed, right? Nine different times, blessed, 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 blessed. The Latin word of that is where we get the word beatitude from. We're going to talk a little bit more about the importance of that word uh, because everything, our understanding of this entire section hangs on the understanding of what it means to be blessed for those who are blessed, right? Now, the reason we're calling the series Citizens is because what we see in the Beatitudes are some of, not all, but some of the primary marks of what it looks like in the lives of people when they have bowed, they have chosen to bow the knee to Jesus and receive him as their own Savior and Lord. In other words, to become disciples or followers of Jesus. So these Beatitudes should be reflecting the character and the attitudes of those who are followers of Jesus. And the result of that decision to become followers of Jesus means we're not just followers of Jesus, we also become citizens of what's called the kingdom of heaven. And with that citizenship come some, some marks, uh, some evidences. Maybe attitudes is helpful. I don't know. Even the word fruit in their lives. Notice them. You can look there in Matthew 5. Those marks are some peop- is that people who are in the kingdom of heaven are poor in spirit, verse 3. We're gonna, I'm not going to unpack all the meanings of all the, the, that today because we're going to be doing that all summer. Um, but somebody who is a citizen of the kingdom of heaven is somebody who is poor in spirit, verse 3. Or somebody who mourns in verse 4. And again, there's, there's a really important meaning there. Somebody who's meek, verse 5. Or somebody who hunger and thirsts for righteousness, verse 6. Or is merciful, verse 7. Or is pure in heart, verse 8. Or somebody who's a peacemaker, verse 9. Or people who will be persecuted because of righteousness, verse 10, or persecuted because of their association with Jesus. You see that in verse 11. Now, the goal isn't that we reflect or uh, resemble one or two of those marks. It, the, the goal is that all of those things are happening at the same time. The more we grow in our relationship and our understanding and our knowledge of Jesus Christ, that those are to be reflections of our character and our nature. And those are all things that will be experienced in the lives of those who are truly citizens of the kingdom of heaven. So to help provide a little more context for what we're going to be talking about for the next few months, I want to look at two passages. And these are two passages that Two verses, really, just that bookend a big section of Scripture. Now, remember, we're only going to be focusing in on chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. But to understand those verses properly, we need to understand the big picture, what, what is going on in the context. So the two verses I'm going to have you look at, first will be Matthew chapter 4, verse 23, Notice that there right before chapter 5, and then you can maybe, we'll, we'll turn there in a minute, but the second passage is going to be Matthew 9, 35. So there are the two, the bookends to this particular passage. Now, before we read them, I just want to tell you what the author, the human author here is Matthew, one of Jesus' disciples, what he's doing here and writing this the way he did, why he has these two verses on both sides of what's known as the Sermon on the Mount and then a few verses after the Sermon on the Mount. It's it's a literary technique. It's something that ancient writers used to do 
and drawing attention to a, a big idea. Here's a big word, it's Father's Day. So I'm giving you a big word today. Write this down and go impress people, all right, this week. The word is inclusio, all right? Inclusio, Matthew is giving us an inclusio. Can we all say inclusio on three? One, two, three. Inclusio, there you go, beautiful. Or if you wanna simplify it, you can call it a theological sandwich, okay? That's basically what he's doing. Now, people in the ancient world reading this would see it, obviously, because it was a technique back in the day, not so much so today. So that's why I'm, I'm pointing it out, and it's important to understand it so that we can properly understand the passage we're going to be looking at all summer. Think of it like this. Matthew chapter 4, verse 23 is one piece of the bread, right, the theological sandwich, Matthew 9, 35 is, is the other piece of bread, uh, and everything else in between makes, uh, uh, that is, makes up that entire section of Scripture is what it is about. So everything in between describes what this section is all about, the inclusio, all right? So here you go. Let's look at Matthew 4, 23. It says there, Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, Notice this, proclaiming the good news, okay? There's other places where uh, he would expand it, like right here, explaining the good news of the what? Not just good news, uh, it's the good news of the kingdom. Also, this is where we, uh, good news there means gospel, all right? So gospel translated here, good news. So he's preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Obviously, we know from the context, it's the kingdom of heaven. Not the Roman kingdom, not the Jewish kingdom, the kingdom of heaven. So he's preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, and keep going, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. So you see um, evidence that the king has come and the kingdom is here is through preaching the good news, the gospel of the kingdom, that's loving in words, and then healing all kinds of disease and sicknesses, Jesus came to love in deeds as well. So he's announcing the kingdom through words and announcing the kingdom through deeds. Now go over to chapter 9, 35. Remember, this is the bookend. This is the other piece of bread. This is, this is the end of the inclusio, okay? 9, 35. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues and doing what? Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and every disease and sickness. This is what you do when you include an inclusio in an ancient text. You say the same thing twice as bookends indicating that everything in between is what this section of scripture is all about. So what this section of scripture is all about is the proclamation of the good news of the kingdom of heaven and revealing that that kingdom has come through miracles, through incredible healing. So verbal and tangible love as announcing that the kingdom of God is here. So based on what we know about this inclusio, this uh, theological sandwich, this, what, so the question is, what is the section about? Right? So I just said it. Let's say it again. I want to make sure you're with me. It's about the good news of the kingdom. So everything that is said and proclaimed in this section of Scripture can be considered good news. The good news, not just good news, the good news of the kingdom, right? And also evidence of the kingdom. What is the evidence of the kingdom? That incredi incredible miracles were happening, that people were literally being transformed now because the kingdom has come. Now here's why all of that matters. Because the Beatitudes are what Jesus is proclaiming. It's not all he's proclaiming, but it's at the very beginning of what he's proclaiming. In other words, at the, it's at the very beginning of his announcing this good news of the kingdom. 
So when we read and study Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12, for the next eight weeks, we will be reading and studying about what? Good news. Are you not excited today? (laughs) Man. Now, let me ask you a question. Can anybody use some good news? Am I the only one? Is it just me? Okay, because I kind of thought, man, we'd be a little more excited. I kind of thought we all live in the same world and that we could all use some good news. And here's what makes it really, really good news. Here's what makes it gospel. It's good news from God. It's good news from God that's telling us even when everything is turned upside down and inside out and nothing is making sense in your life or making sense in the world, Listen, here's the good news. If you're in Christ, you are still a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. And nothing, you can clap, that's good. Uh, and, And nothing will ever change that. Again, if you're a follower of Jesus, because you are now a citizen of this eternal kingdom known as the kingdom of heaven. Now, We good so far? This is all foundational today. So I just need you to be tracking so that next week I don't have to do a sermon on top of a sermon. I don't have to repeat all that, all right? Uh, So back to the key word for the series. I mean, what's the key word for the series? Blessed. Again, he says it like nine times in these 12 verses. Blessed is the key word. Um, And so our understanding of this passage hinges on getting our understanding of this word right. All right, and so the word is blessed. You see it over and over and over. And what does that word mean? Well, it's impossible to translate it perfectly into English. I'm just going to let you know. Um, part of my struggle this week in getting ready for today has been understanding what that word means uh, and putting it into English. Uh, some, some say it, it could be translated happy. Uh, it could be translated fortunate. And there are examples in ancient uh, literature where the word is translated that way. But most scholars will say that blessed is the better translation or the best translation we can use if we want one word to represent what's in the original language. Uh, the Greek word there, if you want a, another big word for you, it's Father's Day. Here you go. Markarion is the Greek word. And, and it has much more spiritual meaning than just simply being happy. That's why happy isn't good enough for what Mark is talking about here. Uh, the reason being is because happiness can change based on circumstances, correct? You can be happy and not happy, right? Just, it could be like one second you're happy and the next second you're not. Just based on stuff that happens. Or fortunate's not best because when you use the word fortunate, especially in our world, in our our culture, uh, it sounds more like the idea of luck or chance, right? So, you know, think of it like that. If you use happy, and there are translations that actually use the word happy. Happy are the peacemakers, or happy are those who mourn, or happy are those who are persecuted, that sort of thing. Like, to be honest with you, like, how are you going to be happy, right, when you're mourning? It, it, that's, it doesn't make sense, honestly, if we really take that word as happy, at least in our understanding. You're not going to be happy when you're mourning, okay? The idea of markarian, though, that Greek word that we translate blessed, carries with it the idea of divine favor or grace, Okay? And that's way more what is, is at the heart of this passage. It's not just about being happy because of circumstances. And it's not just about being fortunate, like I just stumbled into the kingdom of heaven by some accident or chance. You know, oh, wow, I'm a follower of Jesus. That's crazy. Like, no, it's not, that, that feels a little weird, right? It's, so the word means more than that, right? It, it carries this, this idea of divine favor or grace saying that the only reason I'm a part of the kingdom of heaven, the only reason I'm a citizen of the kingdom, the only reason I'm a follower of Jesus and I have eternity with God 
It's because of grace. It's just mercy. It's, it's, it's not anything I just figured out and reasoned and all that or, or was religious enough to achieve or worked hard enough to achieve. achieve. It, wasn't, it wasn't that. It's just God is gracious and God is merciful and offers citizenship in heaven to anyone who will receive Christ as Savior. And so that's why the word blessed is definitely the best to be used. And so as we talk about blessed, 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 nine different times through 12 verses this summer, always remember, man, that's just a gift. That's grace. That is God's mercy in our lives. Now, with all that background established, let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 2. Let's get back to our passage here. Matthew 5. Very beginning of the Beatitudes, very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, verses 1 through 2. Notice what it says. Now, when Jesus saw the crowds, all right, we know this through the Gospels that everywhere Jesus went, most of the time there was a crowd, all right? So when Jesus saw the crowds, that's written in a way to help us understand the crowds being there triggers what's coming next. Now... When Jesus saw the crowds, dot, dot, dot. What does he do? Here's what he does. He went up on a mountainside, right? So obviously they're around some hills there. And sat down, took the posture of a rabbi, of a teacher back in the day. If, if a, a, an ancient rabbi was here, he wouldn't be standing, he'd be sitting. That's kind of traditional posture for a teacher in the ancient world. So he came up on the mountainside, sat down, and it says, his disciples came to him. So Jesus sees the crowd. He sees a mountain. He says, okay, it's time for me to do what I'm about to do. And he goes up to the side of the hill for some reason. And it says, out of the crowd or from among the crowd, his disciples came to him. Disciples remove themselves from the crowd. They come to sit around Jesus. And look what it says. And he began to teach them. Who is the them? The disciples. It makes logical sense, right? They're obviously the closest to teaching is them. The the them there is the disciples. It's the closest connection. So often when we think about the Sermon on the Mount, we think about Jesus going up on the hill so that he can make this big, loud proclamation to thousands of people. When in reality... He was just probably talking at a normal tone of voice to his disciples. Now, when it says disciples there, that doesn't necessarily mean the 12. The 12 has not been solidified yet at this point in Matthew's gospel. But some of the 12 are a part of this group. And then we do know that disciples also meant more than just the 12. When he was talking about just the 12, it would say the 12. But here he's talking about disciples. In other words, these are the people who at this stage of the game have committed to Jesus. At this stage of Jesus' ministry, these are the people who said, we are all in, we are gonna follow you, we are gonna obey you, we are gonna go where you go, we are gonna do what you do, okay? That's who's there, and it says that Jesus is teaching them. So you have typically around Jesus in the Gospels a couple different groups of people. You have the disciples, who now Jesus is teaching. You'll have the crowd who disciples come from, but just because you're in the crowd doesn't mean you're a disciple necessarily. Just like just because you're in a church doesn't mean you're actually a follower of Jesus. Oh, that got personal, sorry. Like, but right, Just because you come into a church doesn't make you a Christian. Same thing, just because you're in the crowd doesn't necessarily mean you are a disciple. And then the third group around Jesus uh, was always the religious leaders. They were a part of the crowd, but the gospel authors tend to always wanna let you know that the religious leaders are there because that's kind of like code word for critics. That's kind of like code word for the guys walking around with the clipboard at work, right? (laughs) Checking out, is he saying the right thing? Is he doing the right thing? That kind of stuff, right? So they're always there. So all these groups of people are there. You have disciples who are saying we're all in. You have the crowd who are saying, eh, we're not sure, but we heard you feed people. That's cool. We want some food. And 
uh, we're kind of here for dinner and a show, show us what you, you know, that kind of thing. And then you have the religious leaders who by and large have no desire to cross the line and follow Jesus, only want to trick him, only want to trap him, right? And ultimately want to kill him. That's what we know from the rest of the gospels, okay? So that's the setting, that's the context, that's the background, that's what we're gonna be talking about for the rest of the summer. Amen, we're done, you wish. You wish. 20 minute sermon. All right, get, buckle up, here we go. So, what are the Beatitudes? I think it's really important we understand what we're talking about here before we start tearing it apart. It's important to know the big picture before we start looking at the little pieces, right? So what are the Beatitudes? Let me tell you a few things they're not. They are not standards to perfect before we can become citizens of the kingdom, okay? Uh, They're not things that we have to perfect or do before God will accept us. They're not hurdles to jump over in order to receive a blessing from God. A lot of us have this view of God that he's like this genie in the bottle, that if we just like, you know, rub it, we get our three wishes, if we just do the right, if we just have the right attitude, that kind of stuff. The problem with that is we'll never do it. We can't do it on our own. It's impossible apart from the grace and mercy of God and the indwelling spirit. So it's not those things. It's not entrance into the kingdom. It's not how you get to the kingdom, though, of course, Some of the attitudes are required for people who are actually going to receive Jesus as Savior, for sure, right? But but carry the logic through. He's not saying you have to be persecuted before you become one of my followers. You don't get persecuted for following Jesus until you're actually following Jesus, right? So so these aren't necessarily hurdles you got to jump over or attitudes you have to have to enter into the kingdom. Remember, it's all God's grace. That's how we got into the kingdom, through Jesus, all right? Here's what they are, though. They are evidence of the Spirit at work in the lives of believers. Okay, so as we walk through it, these things are going to be evident uh, to some measure in the lives of people who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, okay? Um, Think of them like this. They, They are marks not means. Does that help? They're marks. They're marks of people who are citizens of the kingdom, marks of people, evidences of people who are followers of Jesus Christ. Again, to certain levels and degrees and not always perfectly. Some days you'll be more merciful than other days and we're not gonna be perfect, okay? But the idea is that since the moment you came to faith in Jesus, these things are more and more being worked out in your daily life as you grow in your relationship with Jesus and as the Holy Spirit gets more and more and more and more and more of you. Does that make sense? So they're marks, not means. What, what is a mean? A mean is a way in, right? A means In other words, these things would all have to be fulfilled if they're means. I have to do them all to get into the kingdom. They're means into the kingdom if that's what they are. So it's really important to have that distinction. They're not how we get in. They're evidence that we are in. Because the only way you get in is through Jesus. Thank you. We are listening today. This is good. All right. So what are the Beatitudes? Uh, Let me give you some specific ways to think about them. First, they're words of celebration, words of celebration, words to remind, and words of invitation. Three things. Words of celebration, words to remind, and words of invitation. Okay, here we go. First, words of celebration. Celebration for who? Who's celebrating here? Well, those who have chosen to enter into the, in this kingdom that Jesus has been announcing has arrived, right? Those are the people who ce- should celebrate. It's a celebration of the fact that the power of this kingdom has already been doing its work in our hearts. We should be celebrating that. 
uh, that it's already changing us from the inside out, right? Not outside in, inside out. Uh, He's saying this to his disciples and followers, so we know who should be celebrating. The disciples, those who are in, right? Again, verse two, and he began to teach them in reference to the, the disciples. So the Beatitudes are telling us that if you are a follower of Jesus, you, are already, you already have entered into the kingdom of heaven. It's not just something that's someday out there that we're waiting for. It's something you already have to be celebrated, to rejoice in. And that happened through your faith in Jesus. When you put your faith and trust in Christ, um, you've entered into that kingdom. And here's why this is such good news. Because nothing can change your citizenship. Right? Nothing. Notice what it says. Look at just verse 3. Bless all the poor in spirit, for theirs, what? Is present tense is the kingdom of heaven. That word there in the the original language is really important. It's a present tense reality that carries with it eternal or futuristic reality. It is true now, and because it is true now, it will always be true of you. Isn't that amazing? You You are a citizen of the kingdom. The kingdom is yours. And being a part of that has incredible benefits now, not just for eternity, but for sure for eternity. Look at, look at some of them. Look back at verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? Because you can know that the kingdom of heaven is yours. That, that can cheer you up. That can help you get through those dark times. Blessed are those who mourn. How can I do that? For they, notice, for they will be comforted. So there is comfort now, but there's also, remember, eternal comfort. And on and on and on we could go. So why should we celebrate? Because this is true. All these things we said are true for those who are citizens of the kingdom. So let me ask you a question. When was the last time you celebrated the fact that you are a citizen of the kingdom of heaven? How long has it been that you really celebrated your citizenship? I'm not talking about that you put a flag out in front of your garage. Did I just get in trouble? Because I'm talking about a different kingdom. Jesus is talking about a different kingdom. When was the last time you rejoiced over the fact that God has accepted you in spite of all your sin and all your failures, all of my sin and all my failures, and all the ways you, we fall short of God's standard. When was the last time you celebrated that God loves you in spite of all that mess? And that his acceptance of us is not based on our perfection, but on the perfect work of Jesus in his life, death, and resurrection for us. And that we can celebrate because we're citizens, not based on something that we've achieved, but rather something that we've received as a gift of grace in Christ. When was the last time you were just blown away by God's grace and mercy? I am hoping that all summer long is gonna be a celebration. Because every Sunday, we're going to again be looking at how God's grace is amazing and how it's offered to all who are in Christ. What a beautiful thing. You know, it's funny. Speaking of celebration, this past week, I was watching TV. Uh, Pastors do watch TV, believe it or not. And uh, I caught the news and I was watching Denver Nuggets celebrating in downtown Denver this past Thursday. Now, many of you know I'm a Lakers fan. Don't hate me, all right? Like, I'm a Lakers fan. And if you also know basketball, you know that the Nuggets swept L.A. in the Western Final, and then they, they, they killed the Heat in the championship, right? 
What I was blown away was by thousands and thousands, and I know the exact street. I, I used to live in Denver. I saw exactly where there was. Like, oh, I know that place. I know that coffee shop over there and all this stuff. And there were thousands of people. Here's what I know about that section of, of the city. Like, it's not that wide. It's not this huge area. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of people just partying, celebrating, pumped that the Nuggets had won the championship, right? Now, Keep that in mind when I read this next passage. Look at, on the screen, Luke chapter 10, verse 20. The context is Jesus had just sent out his disciples to do ministry. And they come back with these reports of, it was crazy. We were healing people. We were doing all these amazing things. We were even able to cast out demons from people. And, and rather than Jesus going, oh, that's crazy. You know, like he's like, duh, of course. Haven't you been watching me? Haven't you been seeing what I've been doing? And you're my followers. And so, yes, that's the whole point. That's what I've been saying to you. Followers do what their master does, right? So that's what I wanted to show you. And look at his response to their craziness. He goes, however, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. I don't know you about you, but that's pretty cool. You tell a demon to leave a person and they leave. I mean, like, that's pretty awesome. And it is awesome, and it is something to celebrate, but there's something bigger and greater than that. What is that? Well, look what it says. But rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Right? Like that is something. That we lose sight of that. We rejoice about basketball teams winning or whatever, but we come to church and we're like, hmm. <laughs> Whoo, he is taking a long time today. Right? You got to get back home and watch more TV, I know, but good grief, right? Man, let's celebrate. Let's let this summer, and I know we're going to be in and out. I'm here all the rest of the summer on Sundays, but like, I know some of us are going to be taking vacations and all. That's awesome. Go do that. Enjoy. And while you're there, remember, all of that's a gift. Don't worship God's beautiful creation. Let God's beautiful creation point you to the God who created all that. Let that be a worship experience for you. And just remember, that's just the tip of the iceberg of what's to come. Yeah. So the Beatitudes are given to us to remind us to celebrate that we have a citizen, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven and that it's not something we earned, not something we deserve, it's something given and something received. What else are the Beatitudes? Number two, words to remind Right? Words to remind. They're words of celebration. They're also words to remind us. They're words to remind us. This is really important. So much of our celebration will come from being reminded about what we already have in Jesus and who we are in Jesus and what's to come because of Jesus. As humans, it's easy to forget that we are blessed, isn't it? Easy to forget that we're blessed by God. The world's a mess. Our lives are a struggle, right? Just me, you too. Life is a struggle. There's reasons to be discouraged everywhere we look, right? Isn't that true? Let's be honest. I mean, like, if we can't be honest here, so let's be honest about it. Man, everywhere we look, there, there's reasons to be discouraged for sure. So we need to be reminded that we are are blessed. We are divinely favored in Christ. Now, I want to point out a couple things that they specifically remind us of. First is they remind us of our true citizenship. Okay. Now, I think I only put citizenship. Would you put true citizenship in front of that? You could also say most important citizenship. That's one of the things the Beatitudes remind us of. Every single day of our lives, we are tempted, we are encouraged to give our allegiance to other kingdoms and other kings every day, almost every second of our lives. Kingdoms like race, kingdoms like gender, kingdoms like ethnicity, like kingdoms of country, 
kingdoms of political parties, kingdoms of economics, like on and on and on and on I could go. There's this race for the ruling of our hearts. And these competing kingdoms come at us all the time. And we need scripture, like the Beatitudes, to remind us that, yeah, there's other competing kingdoms. There's other things you need to be concerned about in life. But there is nothing, nothing, nothing more important than your true king and your true uh, citizenship. So the, the, the Beatitudes come along and remind us of that. You know, there's another inclusio happening here. Don't you love that word? I like saying it. <laughs> There's another inclusio, another theological sandwich happening in this passage. And it's actually happening in the Beatitudes themselves. Can I show you that? You might have already picked up on it. Look at verse 3 and 10. What does he repeat? What's repeated between verses 3 and 10? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Meaning everything in between is about the kingdom of heaven. Theirs and, and who gets the kingdom of heaven and who's in the kingdom of heaven. That's, that's, that's the sandwich that's taking place here in the Beatitudes. And again, repeat it over in verse 12, the beginning of that. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in, doesn't say in America, doesn't say because you're a male or female. Doesn't say because you vote a certain way. Doesn't say because you have a certain amount of money in, in the bank account. Uh, it just says great is your reward because your reward is in heaven. It's in this other kingdom that cannot be touched and cannot and will not be done away with. That tells us that everything packed in there is about that. And again, we're going to get into that in the weeks to come. So the Beatitudes remind us that in this life, there will be challenges and difficulties. But there's coming a day where all of that's going to go away. All the pain, all the hurt, injustice, all the sorrow, all the sin, all the shame, all the persecution. All of it gone forever because of our citizenship in the kingdom. And that's why the Apostle Paul said these words to the church in Philippi. You guys remember we were there a few months ago. Well, not in Philippi, but we were in, <laughs> I wish we were, but in that section of the Bible, uh, because these, this church was experiencing persecution from outside, remember, because they're Christians, but then also division within the church. And he reminded them, here's what helped them lift their eyes from their troubles, Here's what helped them celebrate. He had to remind them of their true citizenship. Notice this, Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven. It's in a different kingdom. Yes, life is hard. Yes, it's difficult. Of course, we're talking about the early church here. Persecuted for their faith in ways that we can't even comprehend yet because we have not experienced it yet. But he's saying, get your eyes off that. Remember where your true citizenship is. Remember where your true citizenship lies. Remember who your king is. But our citizenship's in heaven. And, and, and it's okay to long for that kingdom. Look what he says. And we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's something we have to be really careful of this summer. As we go through the Beatitudes, that we're not celebrating and more thankful for the gifts than the giver. Notice what he says, our citizenship's in heaven, that's good news, but, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus needs to mean more to us than his kingdom, okay? And by the way, you're not in his kingdom unless he means more. <laughs> that's how you got in. Reminder, kingdoms come and go. That's the story of history. They rise and they fall. The good news of the kingdom of heaven is that since God is the one who established it, it's eternal. Remember, if this is God's kingdom, he's eternal. Everything he does is eternal. 
So you can rest in that. It's the only kingdom that will never end and has no true, real rivals. No competitors. And in the end, it will only be the kingdom of heaven that's standing. And only one king. Right? Remember this. You can write this down if you like. We are citizens of a kingdom that has come. It has come. It is coming. And it is yet to come. It has come in and through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. That's why over and over and over he keeps saying the kingdom's here, the kingdom's here, the kingdom's here. Because the king is here. It is coming, right? As more and more people bow their hearts and their wills to Jesus and turn to his grace and his mercy by the power of the spirit and live out his principles in their daily lives, the kingdom through that continues to be coming into the world, but there is coming a day when Jesus will return. Amen? Yeah, don't forget that. He's going to return and will establish his kingdom physically on earth. Right now, his kingdom is a spiritual reality that definitely works itself out in the physical world, but you don't see Jesus on a throne here right now. Technically, you should, through the ministry and life of the church, be seized, see Jesus seated and ruling on a throne. We are actually the visible representation of Jesus. That's why we're called the body of Christ. So in one sense, the world should be seeing a a risen Lord ruling and reigning on earth through his church, through mercy and grace and love and truth, right? But there is coming a day, we know, when Christ will return and physically, visibly set up his kingdom on earth earth. So the kingdom has come, is coming, and will come in the future. So the Beatitudes remind us of our true citizenship. They also remind us of our true identity. They remind us of our true identity. And uh, I, I think that's all I want to say about that because we're going to spend the rest of the summer talking about that, our true identity. So just know that when you read the Beatitudes, That's what you're reading. You're reading the identity of a believer. You're reading the identity of a citizen of heaven. Okay, so I think that's good enough for now. So the Beatitudes are words of celebration. Beatitudes are words to remind. And then lastly, they are words of invitation. Write that down. Isn't that cool? The words of invitation. Remember in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 2, it says there's the crowds. And there's the disciples. We know from the context in verses one through two that he's speaking to his disciples, those who have already said, we are all in, we're with you wherever you're going, whatever you do, we're we're about it, right? But notice something interesting. Even though he wasn't directly teaching the crowds or even speaking directly to the crowds, they were eavesdropping. They were listening in, right? Look over at chapter seven. Chapter 7, verses 28 to 29. So this is at the end of the sermon. Uh, Just so you know, uh, most scholars will tell you this sermon, this is just a summary of the sermon. So you can read through it in two minutes. So don't expect like sermons should be two minutes. I just wanted to, most scholars are going to tell you it's a summary of what he said. So don't be giving me this, hey, Pastor Chris, you need to be like Jesus. Preach a two-minute sermon. (laughs) I know some of you already went there. Uh, So, verse 28. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he was done preaching a sermon. Look at this. The crowds were amazed at his teaching. Was he teaching the crowds? No. Were the crowds listening? Yes. And so, in one sense, what Jesus is doing is teaching his disciples, this is what you have as citizens of the kingdom. When the world looks like it's upside down and torn apart, trust me, there's more going on than that. And you have hope and you have a future. Oh, and by the way, those of you who aren't in the kingdom yet, come on in. That's how good it is. Your your only examples visually of, of rulers and kings are Roman emperors. I'm so sorry for you, but let me tell you, I'm a way better king than that. And I'm opening the doors wide open and saying, come on in. 
Come on into this kingdom where even the poor and the miserable and the mourning and the persecuted can be loved and welcomed and have an eternal home and transformed more and more into who God originally intended you to be as a human being. Come on in. What an invitation. It's an invitation for believers to celebrate. So I told you this summer we're going to party. Sundays are for partying, all right? In a holy, sanctified way, don't take me wrong. Our communions won't be like that in 1 Corinthians, okay? Like, we're not getting that crazy, but celebrating, yeah, that's another sermon. Um, it's an it's a invitation to continued transformation, right? Yes, this is true of you, but also we read the rest of the Bible and we know that we're not done. Yeah, we have far to go that God wants to continue to transform us from the inside out. We are not all perfect images of Jesus, believe it or not. And so we've got growth to pursue, transformation to continue to pursue. So it's an invitation to that. And just, it's an invitation to rest. The world's culture is about keep going, improve, get better, you know, dog eat dog, like be in ch- be the best. There's not room for mourning. There's not room for dealing with death. There's not room for weeping. There's not room for that stuff in the culture. It's like, move on. When was the last time you were like at a party and somebody was talking about death, the reality of death? It doesn't come up. We try and avoid it as much as we can. And this is like, hey, this is a place where you can come and rest. And we can talk about those kinds of things with a hopefulness because we know it's not the end of the story. So it's an invitation to believers, but it's also an invitation to the not yet believers, to the skeptics. We love you. I love skeptics. I'm kind of a skeptic myself. I'm just a converted skeptic. I'm still skeptical about a lot of things. It's an invitation to to you to a new citizenship, one that's not based on your performance or your appearance or your ethnicity or your political views or your financial status or your gender or your successes or your failures. It's a citizenship that is solely based on the grace and mercy of God. It's a kingdom where you'll never lose your favored status. Find that somewhere, anywhere in the world. Everything you're a part of, you can lose your favored status. Don't pay your mortgage. See what happens. <laughs> right? Like, see what happens. It's a kingdom that will never end because it's not based on the performance of humans. It's completely based on the goodness of God and the perfect performance of Jesus 2,000 years ago. That's why Jesus said to all of us, Matthew 11, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. That's the words of Jesus. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Let's do that this summer. Let's get up close with Jesus. Let's yoke in with him. Let's pull the plow together with him. For I'm gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. Who needs that today? Rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So Father of Jesus, will you receive these beatitudes as an invitation for joy? Will you allow them to cause you to press deeper into your relationship with Jesus so that your true identity in Christ will become more and more your daily experience in life. For those of you who are not yet followers of Jesus, again, the skeptics, will you believe that today that there's a better kingdom? Will you just believe that? We trust that the one who predicted his death and resurrection and actually pulled it off might know some things? Might be God? Here's what we all need to be reminded, especially skeptics. You're, you are a citizen of some kingdom. You serve someone in something. Like that's, we all do. We, that's part of being human. That's just a reality. 
The good news is that Jesus has come to create a greater kingdom, a better kingdom, uh, an eternal kingdom that cannot be destroyed and that no kingdom in history or the future can be compared to. So will you find your rest in Jesus today? Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this morning, this, this opportunity to praise you and worship you here as we've gathered and done in so many different ways. And now, God, we ask that you'd give us those ears to hear what you are saying to us. Spirit, would you take your words and put them into our hearts? May we hear exactly what we need to hear individually and then collectively as Crossroads Church. For those of you who are, who are maybe in that skeptic or not yet believer category, I'm just gonna ask you today, would you believe that what you heard today is true? I'm sure you've tried a lot of different ways. You know you're serving something or someone and you know that it's not getting it done. You know that deep down inside, you know. Would you turn to Christ today? The Bible says anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So right where you are, from your heart to God's, to say, God, would you forgive me of my sin? Would you save me? Would you make me a citizen of your kingdom now and forever? God, would you do that? God, would you hear those prayers and save those people? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.